21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Who's missing? Is that your wife? How do you spell that? D-E or G-E? Where is it you live? Where? You are by transcription in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right, I'll tell you what you do. You better come into the station house and talk to the detectives. That's right. Come right on in here. Twenty-first precinct. It's just lines on the map of the city of New York. Most of the one hundred seventy-three thousand people wedged into the nine tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the twenty-first. Whether or not they know it, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the twenty-first precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants, of whom I'm the boss. My name is Cronin, Vincent P. Cronin. I'm captain in command of the 21st Precinct. I was doing night duty, 4 p.m. to 8 a.m. After I turned out the platoon, I read and signed reports and communications that had accumulated since I was last on duty. At 5.50, I walked out of my office into the muster room while Lieutenant Gorman was desk officer and Sergeant Waters was on telephone switchboard duty. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Hello, Captain. Sergeant. You don't have to ring in Captain? to ask me that. Red. I'll uh, go on patrol now, Red. Yes, sir. These rooks ring in every time they want to take a deep breath. Didn't you, Sergeant? Oh, yes, sir, I guess I did. <laughs> I have a car come by the house for me. I'm going out on patrol. Yes, sir. Right away. Step right up here to the desk, mister. I'd uh, like to get a little information. Yes, sir. What? Well, it's a long story. Okay. I'd, uh, I'd just like to know what to do about it. To do about what? Well, you see, about six, eight weeks ago, on the 26th of April, to be exact, I come home from work, and my wife was in the living room, and she had company. Another woman, a girl about 20, 21. I didn't know who she was, so there were introductions all around. My wife said she was Mrs. Lois Natick. Anyway, this Mrs. Natick had a baby with her, a baby boy, about nine months. His name is Richie, the baby. So? Well, so I sit there wondering when supper's going to go on the table and what this Mrs. Natick is doing there. And then Cora, uh, that's my wife, she springs it on me. Mm -hmm. We're taking in a paying guest, she says, the baby. Well, it hits me right between the eyes, but I'm polite about the whole thing. I take Cora in the kitchen. I ask her, what's this all about? Are you going nuts or something? So she gives me a long song and dance about how another lady she met in the delicatessen told her about Mrs. Natick was looking for some place to board the baby for a couple of months. Cora's dying to have the kid in the house. She won't take no for an answer. So to make a long story short, we took in a baby. Well, what do you want us to do about it? Oh, well, I'm not asking you to do anything about it. All I'm asking for is a little information. Did uh, Mrs. Natick pay anything? Well, that's just the point. You see, my wife made an agreement that we'd board this baby for $12.50 a week. Mm -hmm. So when she left the kid with us, she gave us $37.50 to cover the first three weeks. She said she'd either come by the house or send us the money before the three weeks were up. How much has she sent you since? Nothing. Not one lousy cent. That's what I'm so burned up about. We got the kid, we haven't heard a word from her, not a single word. I see. So what I'd like to know is uh, what am I supposed to do? What's your name? Me? Yeah. Fruit, Harry Fruit. How do you spell that? F-R-O-U-D-E. F-R-O-U-D-E. Where do you live? 502 York Avenue. Uh, listen, are you the captain here? Yeah, that's right. I'm Captain Cronin. Oh, I'm glad to know you. Glad to know you. Well, is there something that can be done? I mean, where, where do I go? Who do I see? Well, there might be something that can be done, Mr. Froude. This uh, child or the mother is not related either to you or your wife. Related? I never saw either one of them before in my life. I saw the woman just that once in my living room when I come home from work. Oh, where do you work, Mr. Froude? Downtown Lafayette Street. I'm an order filler. You know, a stock clerk in one of those electrical supply houses, Donowitz Brothers. Mm, you been there long? Oh, a couple of years. That's all the Donowitz Brothers been in business. But I've been down there on the street, oh, 18, 20 years, working for one company or another. This woman, the mother... Mrs. Natick. Uh, Mrs. Lois Natick, Natick yeah. yeah. She agreed to pay you twelve fifty a week to board the child. That's right, twelve fifty a week. I told my wife, I told her, you know, Cora, twelve fifty a week to take in a kid is nothing today. No, nothing. I mean, it'll cost more than just that expenses out of the pocketbook. But she's got to have the kid. Got to have him. I couldn't even reason with her. How long have you been married, Mr. Fruit? Sixteen years. Any children of your own? 
No, no, we got no children. Not that we didn't want any. I mean, her especially. It was just one of those things the way it worked out. There was no children. Well, what did uh, Mrs. Natick tell your wife? What do you mean? I mean, why did she say she had to board the baby in a foster home? Oh, well, she said that she had a chance of a pretty good job in one of those airplane factories out in Long Island. She said she wanted to take the job, but that she couldn't do that and take care of the kid, too. So she wanted to take the job so she could save up some money. Did she give you the address where she lived out in Long Island? She said she sent it when she got settled. Did she send it? Yeah, yeah, like she sent the twelve fifty a week. Did this uh, Mrs. Nanick live with her husband? Look, I don't even know that she had one. I mean, I asked the people in the building where she was staying there. They never saw any husband around. Did she leave any forwarding address with the people at the building? Nothing. She just left. And she owes you approximately four weeks' board? Approximately, yeah, just about. All right, Mr. Frood, you and your wife bring the child into the station house. If what you told us can be substantiated... Oh, it could we... be uh, substantiated, all right. Then the mother's guilty of abandonment. You make the complaint here, and we'll see the child is taken care of. I'll be in my office, Lieutenant. Thanks, Captain. Thanks a lot. Oh, uh, listen, uh, Captain. Oh, huh? yeah. Uh, I, I just wanted you to know that I got nothing against this little fellow, you know. I mean, he's all right, see? But I just hate being made a chump out of, you know what I mean? Yeah, sure, I understand. I mean, it's just a rotten, lousy thing for that mother to do, and I'm not going to be the sucker in this deal. How does your wife feel about it? Well, look, it don't make any difference how she feels about it. I'm the guy that's paying the bills. And I got enough to pay with 63 34 a week take-home pay without worrying about somebody else's obligations. All right, Mr. Frood. You and your wife come into the station house with the child. We'll get it all straightened out. Okay, I'll go home right now and get him. You can wait until tomorrow if the baby's asleep. You've had him this long. Another night won't make any difference. To you, I know it don't make any difference, Captain. To me, it's plenty of difference. A few minutes after Harry Frew left the station house, sector car number three came by to take me on patrol of the precinct. I had my operator, patrolman Mikado, drive to several of the parks and playgrounds in the city to check on reports that youths in unduly large numbers had been congregating in the early evening hours and causing disturbances. Before returning to the station house, we made a swing to the south end of the precinct by way of York Avenue. Oh, what's the trouble, Mr. Frew? Captain, she's gone. My wife. Hmm? She, she, she's gone and she took the kid with her. Now, why did she leave? I don't know. I, I thought it was all settled. You know, we were going to bring the kid in here tomorrow. Mm. I went to bed. You know, I got to get up early to go to work. Cook Cora said she'd go in the kitchen and make the sandwiches for my lunch. Yeah, I've been taking my lunch the last couple of years. I mean, it gets so you can't buy a decent lunch anymore for less than a buck. Yeah. So she makes the sandwiches at night and then she puts them in an, in an ice box. you know, so it isn't such a rush in the morning with the baby and everything. And she left after you fell asleep? That's right. She, she just took the baby and left. Any idea where she went? No, I don't have any idea at all. When did you discover she was gone? Oh, gee, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm usually a sound sleeper, you know, very sound. I, I guess I, I just felt something was wrong. I woke up and she wasn't in the bed. So I went out in the living room. I went into the kids' room. She wasn't there. Did she have any relatives she could have gone to? That's the funny part of it, Captain. Not a soul. A sister in Boston, that's all the relatives she's got. Well, what about friends? Oh, well, it was so late, I, I didn't feel like calling anybody. Is there anybody in the building she could have gone to? No. Hmm? How about a hotel? Oh, I don't think so. She didn't take any money. Oh, huh? nothing? Well, I mean, payday is tomorrow. She didn't have only a couple of dollars left. She left a couple of dollars right on a dresser. She took it out of her pocketbook and left it right on a dresser. Captain, I don't think she took a cent with her. Not a cent. That's what worries me. You're positive she didn't go to some friend? Can't be positive, but I don't think so. Well, you ought to check some of your friends in the neighborhood. Oh, I wouldn't want to do that, Captain. I've been in enough trouble tonight. It's late. They all got to get up early in the morning, everybody... I not want to wake any of them up. If she didn't have any money with her, Mr. Frood, that's where you're going to find her, I think. Mr. Frood finally took my suggestion and went home to bed. In the meantime, we notified the detectives, CB, and the Missing Persons Bureau. As patrolmen on post and in sector cars in the 21st rang in, the sergeant on TS gave each of them a description and told them to be on the lookout for the woman and the child. In the meantime, the first deputy commissioner visited the precinct. As the ranking officer on duty in the 6th Division during the night, he asked me to accompany him on his visits to the other precincts in the division. While I was on this tour with the deputy police commissioner, sector car number 3 responded to a radio call to meet the subway station agent in the 68th Street station of the Lexington Avenue local. There he is, in the booth. Did you call the station house? Uh, yeah, yeah, wait a minute. I'll be right out. Over here. Two passengers called into my attention. 
Thanks, Warren, sir. Yeah. And, and I've been watching her. Thanks. As far as I know, she's been sitting there a couple of hours. Over there. On the bench. Woman with the baby. She's been sitting there. Yeah. Okay, you can go on back if you want. We'll handle it. Oh, good, thanks. It, it seems awful funny. Huh? Yeah. No, I'll see you. What was the name of the woman? The, uh, the woman with the baby? Prude? Yeah. Yeah, Prude. That could be her. Excuse me, ma'am. He sleeps. He woke up when an express passed a little while ago. I had a hard time getting him to go back. The station agent says you've been sitting here for a couple hours. Did he? That's what he told us. Where are you going? Well, I don't know. I'm trying to make up my mind. It's kind of late to be out with a baby, isn't it? He's all right. I take good care of him. Oh, I hope this train doesn't wake him up. They make an awful lot of noise. Well, this isn't a nursery. It's, it's a subway station. Yeah. Yes, it isn't there, Paul. Are you Mrs. Brew? What? Are you Mrs. Brew? I still didn't hear you. I asked if you were Mrs. Brew. Yes, yes, I'm Mrs. Brew. We've been looking for you. Oh, I guess Harry woke up and saw I was gone. I guess he did. Well, I don't want to give Richie up. I, I can't give him up. I wanted him so long. So long. You haven't any idea how long. We better go into the station house and talk about it, Mrs. Pruden. Well, do we have to? Yes, we'd better. Yeah, I'm not going to give him up. Look, he even smiles when he sleeps. You've never seen such a happy baby. He's so happy. Yes, ma'am. He won't be happy if they take him away from me. Nobody will be happy. Nobody. Come on, Mrs. Frude. All right. So funny. Everything's so funny. He's hers and she doesn't want him. I want him and I can't have him. So funny. The two officers took Mrs. Frude and the child upstairs to their car and drove them to the station house. I had just returned from my tour of the division with the first deputy commissioner. I asked Mrs. Frude to wait in my office. Then I instructed the desk officer to notify Mr. Frude that his wife was at the station house. After a few minutes, I walked toward my office. Through the open door, I could see her holding the sleeping child tightly in her arms. She looked down at him finally. We notified your husband, Mrs. Fruit. Oh, I didn't want you to do that. You didn't have to bother him. I see it was done as a matter of course. He told us that you were missing. Oh, well, is he coming? I sent an officer around to tell him you were here. Hmm. I think he really likes Richie. I don't understand him. I'll be out or in the kitchen or someplace and... I'll come in and find him playing with the baby, and he jumps away like he was caught stealing something. I don't understand him. He told me the mother's making a sucker out of him. Yes, he told me that too, but maybe it's not her fault. I don't see how anybody could help caring about Richie. Maybe she's sick or something. Could happen, couldn't it? Couldn't that be why she didn't send the money? We'll find out. The detectives will start checking into it. Do they have to take him away from me? Can't I keep him till they find out something? According to the law, Mrs. Frood, when a parent has agreed to pay for a child in a foster home and goes away without leaving an ascertainable address or continuing to arrange for board, the child is considered abandoned. I haven't abandoned him. I want him. Yeah, but he's not yours. It's up to the Department of Welfare to provide shelter for him. Can't I keep him? Isn't there any way? Yeah, it probably is. If you can get your husband to agree to seek adoption. Harry? Oh, not the way Harry feels. He wouldn't agree to anything. Well, he likes the boy. You said that yourself, and he told me he did. Yes, I know, but he's so sore at Mrs. Natick. He's so sore he takes it out on Richie and on me. She, she... Hmm? Oh, excuse me. I thought he was stirring. Look, like a log. He's really a good baby. He's so happy. Babies usually aren't. That's all. 
How far down you want to go, Captain? No, take a swing around 57th. That's it. Over to Lexington, back up to the house. Yes, sir. That's car number one in the next block. Yeah. Must be on a job. Pull up behind him, McCarter. That's it. Let's see what it is. Doesn't look like much, Captain. Wasn't anything on the air. Come on. Yes, sir. That must be it. 502. There's Zeisman coming out. Zeisman? Oh, hello, Captain. What have we got? Oh, nothing much, Skipper. When we rang in, the sergeant told us to take a turn by here. A neighbor called in that a couple was scrapping. Family fight. A neighbor thought he was beating her up. Something about a baby. What's the name of the couple? Frood, Captain. Mr. and Mrs. Harry Frood. Well, what floor are they on? Um, second floor front, Captain. But it's all settled. They quieted down. Yeah, I, I know them. I uh, want to talk to them. Oh. Get back on the job, Eisman. Yes, sir. Mercado. Yes, sir. You wait down here. Yes, sir. Cronin. Who? Captain Cronin, the 21st Precinct. Oh, all right. Uh, there's no trouble, Captain. Everything's fixed up. You didn't have to come. No, no, I was just passing by. Oh. Is uh, this Mrs. Food? Yeah, yeah, it's Mrs. Food. Okay, come on in, Captain. Thank you. It's the first time, believe me, the first time since we're married that we fought like that. Arguments, sure, but not fights like this. Cora, Cora, th this, this is Captain Cronin. He's the captain I spoke to at the police station. How do you do, Mrs. Fruit? How do you do? I'm sorry. It was my fault. I, I screamed. It was me. Harry tried to keep me quiet. Yeah, well, it's all over now. He said you told him to bring me and the baby to the police station. Is that right? If the baby's been abandoned, yes. Well, I'm taking care of him. I'm taking good care well, of him. Cora, we've been through that. Now, we've been through that time and time but again. it's the truth. Hey, Captain, would you like a nice cool can of beer? I got so many ice boxes. No, 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 thanks. We couldn't keep him? Isn't there any way? How many times have I got to say it? I'm not going to be the chump in this deal, Cora, not Shh, me. Shh, you'll wake him up. He didn't wake up from what went on before. He ain't going to wake up now. Would you like to see him, Captain? Cora. He's such a fine boy. No, no, don't wake him up. Mr. No, we Cora. won't wake him. This way. Now, you stay here, Harry. Don't worry. Did you ever see such a butterball? <laughs> I love him. You don't know how I love him. How many children do you have, Captain? Uh, two. Two? Mm. My. Shh. Two is a nice family. Everybody except me. I always wondered why everybody except me. Oh, now, don't ask foolish questions. Harry says we have to bring him to the police station tomorrow. What will you do? We'll try to find the mother and place charges of abandonment against her. Well, what about him, Richie? The New York family home. It's a very nice institution. Oh, no, no. He's not your responsibility, Mrs. Fruit, if the mother abandoned well, him. Well, just because the mother abandoned him, is that a reason for me to abandon him? Cora, we've been through all that now. We've been all through it so much the neighbors had to call the police. Now, please. Harry, give me some light. Look, the answer is, has been, and always will be no. No, no. That dame made a monkey out I'm of us. I'm not thinking of her. I'm thinking of him. He's got nothing to do with it. And she's not going to get away with it. That kid gets turned over tomorrow. Harry! Now, hey, now, folks, come on. Let's settle down. It's now. settled down, Captain, and it's settled. Tomorrow, bright and early. You're listening to 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way police work in the world's greatest city. What was the old West really like? Were the men who won it really all cardboard heroes with strong jaws, loyal horses, and little sense? Were the bad men all mustache twirlers who spent their spare time kicking dogs and little children? If that stereotype picture seems a little ridiculous to you... Join Marshal Matt Dillon, upholder of the law in Dodge City, for an authentic and revealing story of the Old West on Gunsmoke every Saturday. It's surefire entertainment. And now back to 21st Precinct and Captain Cronin. It was settled. The husband made the decision. The wife had apparently resigned herself to it. She sat on the couch and stared down at the floor. I said goodnight to each of them and left. When I returned to the station house and walked up the front steps into the muster room, 
A wildly gesticulating man was standing in front of the desk trying to make himself understood. Wait a minute. No comprendo. See? Hable despacio. Oh, repetal. Oh, oh see, see, trouble, see. Sergeant. This is what trying to find out, Captain. Well, he, he just walked dijo, in. Dije que, que ellos... Oh, 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 Sergeant, did you call upstairs to the detective? Fernandez on the job tonight? Yes, he's working, but he's out on patrol. They're trying to locate him. I think he's trying to tell me he was robbed. Uh, uh, como se llamo usted? Eh? Uveda. Fernando. Yo sé que Uveda. Pues, ella y su amigo. Me robaron. Pues, él tenía un cuchillo. Un cuchillo y me robaron. De todo mi dinero. Just a second, pare. Sí, sí, sí. Tenga la bondad. Habla despacio. Oh, de, de espacio. Pues sí, 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 pues. Muestro sus uh, papers, uh, uh, papales. Oh, sí, sí, los papeles. Aquí, yeah, aquí, 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 aquí tengo. Well, aquí está. Mire, mire, aquí. Oh, well, he's going to show you his sí. wallet. Uh, soy navegador. Mi, mi barco está, está en, en Hoboken. Me robaron. Ah, qué carnazo. Con un cuchillo me robaron. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, pare. Sí, 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 pare. I uh, think he's a merchant seaman. I think that's what this card says. Uh, ¿Cuál es su nacionalidad? ¿Nacionalidad? Sí. Sudamericano, argentino. Es mi argentino. Excuse me. Uh, ¿Cuál es su book? Uh, eh? Ship. Uh, 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 buque. Oh, 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 el buque. <laughs> mi barco es la recalde. Ask him if he's hurt. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, ¿Está usted uh, herido? Oh, sí, por supuesto, pues sí. Me dieron un golpe en la espalda aquí. Aquí un, un golpe con un palo. All Pero right, right, de todo mi dinero. Hold it. Sí, 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 sí. sí. Yeah. El okay, detective Fernández. He's Oiga, on his señor. way in here. Oh, Oiga, that's good. Uh, quiero mi dinero, ¿eh? No tengo ni un uh, real. No, pare. Espere un momento. Uh, wait a minute. Oh. Uh, 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 a detective uh, quiere hacerle... Algunas preguntas. Oh, preguntas. Tanto. Sí, sí, sí. Oh, no. Captain, are you busy? Can I see you a minute? Oh, oh Mr. Good. Uh, it's very important, Bye. Captain. Bye. Yeah, all right, Mr. Good. I'll be in my office, Sergeant. Yes, sir. All right. Come on, come on to my office, Mr. Good. Yes, yeah, sure. Go ahead, Brandon. Thanks. If the person taking care of them is happy doing it. Yes. I know I'm happy. I've been married all these years, and I've never been so happy. That's what I think maybe the matter with Harry is. I think he's jealous. Imagine. Jealous of a little thing like this. Come in. Ah, come in, Mr. Food. Thanks. Uh, should I close the door? Uh, yes, please. Hello, Cora. Harry? Why'd you have to run off like that, Cora? You scared me half to death, half to death. I'm sorry, Harry. Sorry? Well, you should be sorry. Shh, you wake him. Now, you see, Captain, you see? That, that's all I get. You'll wake the baby. Don't play the television. Don't smoke my pipe. It's bad for him. We can't go to the movies. There's nobody to leave him with. Out of the twelve and a half dollars a week we didn't get, we have to pay for sitters Harry. yet. Harry. my age, I have to have an infant around. At my age, I don't need it. All I need is a little peace and quiet. Nobody thinks about me anymore. All right, Harry, I'm going to give him back. The welfare department does something with him. You'll have your peace and quiet. You want to take him now, Captain? Well, look, uh, it's, it's late now, Cora. Let's go home with him. You've you got all his things in. We'll make arrangements in the morning. No, I can't take him home. I want to leave him right here and right now. I can do that, can't I? I'll have to get a policewoman up here, take him to the New York filing home. Now, look, look, Cora, now, now, don't be stubborn. I mean, do we have to lose a whole night's sleep? I've got to be at work at 8 o'clock. Let, let's go home. You'll get the whole thing straightened out tomorrow. I'm not taking this baby in my house again, not unless I take him there to stay. I'm not. You got your way, didn't you? What else do you want from me? You could at least try to make it a little easy on me. Harry, I'm ashamed of you. You you don't know what you put me through. You big 
escape you. You don't realize how much I love you to do this for you, to give the baby up for you. Cora, honey, cut it out. I won't cut it out. You haven't got a brain in your head, not one brain. I guess maybe I haven't. Maybe you're right, Cora. Ca Captain, I guess I'm a loss. Are you? Yeah. Yeah, I, I know I am. Captain, I, I want to admit to you right here and now that, that Mrs. Natticke has sent me $12.50 and, and every week to, to the place where I work. Every week. Oh, uh -huh. that's so. Harry, you're not kidding. No, 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 I'm not kidding. The, the baby is paid up to date. Paid up. Well, what did you do with the money? Hmm? Oh, well, I, 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 I got to admit it, Cora. I, I, uh, I got to admit it, I, I, I spent it. I spent every last cent. Playing the ponies. Every, every last cent I spent. But, but she's been right on the button with, every Monday morning in the mail with the money, with the 12.50 cash, in a plain envelope. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, where were they postmarked from? Well, from all over. Oh. She, she, she was traveling. Can we keep him now? Can we? If the board bill is paid up, the baby hasn't been abandoned. Why, that's wonderful, Harry. That's just wonderful. You spent that money on the horses? Yep. Well, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. The baby's money on the horses. How are you going to win, Captain? You just can't win. Well, at least there's one thing in a marriage, Harry. You can't do any worse than come in second. Go on. I'll catch up with it. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Who shot? Who? Well, where? All right, take it easy. Talk slower so I can understand. And so it goes. Now, Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. The police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh-and-blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring, or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct transcribed a factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the police department, city of New York. James Gregory, in the role of Captain Cronin, Harold Stone as Sergeant Waters, and featured in tonight's cast were Santos Otega, Ralph Camargo, Bill Quinn, George Petrie, Mandel Kramer, and Elspeth Eric. 21st Precinct is written, produced, and directed by Stanley Niss. Bill Martin speaking. Here, there, and everywhere, election excitement is sparked, and you're likely to run into the CBS News campaign cavalcade, the special 12-man unit set up to follow every important pre-election and election story as it develops, no matter where it develops. Through many news programs throughout the day, the campaign cavalcade will keep in touch with you. Stay tuned for five minutes of CBS News to be followed on most of these same stations by My Son Jeep.